Ocean Hills at its best is when we are in it together. Thankful for your partnership in the gospel with us. And uh, that, that word gospel is really what we're, what we're talking about in this series. We're in a series called Gospel, Good News. And just listen to that phrase for a minute, good news. Good news. Isn't that kind of an oxymoron a little bit for our culture? You know, I mean, if you ever turn on the news, anybody, anybody watch news just incessantly? My parents are addicted to news. I, I, every time I go to their house, they have it on like 24-7. And it is not good news on, on TV or in the paper or wherever you read news. Uh, we, we're so good in this culture at telling the bad news, you know, telling what is wrong with this world. And, uh, and so if you're here this morning, we want you to know there is good news for you. There is good news for you today. No matter what you heard this week, there's good news for you. No matter what your boss said to you, there is good news. No matter what your bank statement said, there's good news. No matter what happened in your marriage or your family or your friendships, there is good news today for you. And so we hope that, that you would experience that, that you would sense that, that you would feel it today. The good news is here and, and it is real. And that's why we come to celebrate every week, week after week. We got to come. We hear so much bad news. We got to come back every week to remember the good news. Amen? To remember what it's all about, that Jesus is alive. And, and, and he is in us. And so that's what we're, we're going to be looking at in this series. What is the gospel? It comes from the Greek word euangelion, which is um, really a, a word that means good message, literally in Greek. Euan is good, gelion, message. And, and the, uh, the four gospel writers uh, are called the four evangelists because that's where we get our word evangelism, euangelion. It's, a, it's the word for evangelist, evangelism, gotten kind of a bad rap in our culture, but really it just means good news. And, and that's that, the good message. So that's, that is what we are, are studying. Scott Lasea started us off last week and he's writing his dissertation on this, what is the good news? Um, so, so you can read about that later, but some of what I'm, I'm taking is from his work on that. And, and last week he talked about what, what the gospel is not. He talked about how people have settled for a lesser gospel. They've settled for something that isn't the whole gospel, but there's, it's compartmentalized. And, and settling for a lesser gospel fragments us. And, and, it, and he, he found this picture in a magazine of a woman in a pink uh, sweatsuit, and she's running. And this, this is the woman, that, this is the, the, not the woman that caught his attention. This is the magazine, the, the, the picture that caught his attention. This woman is fragmented, and she's, uh, it, it, she's just going, and, and her, her life is not aligned. And he was acting it out a little bit, and he said, you might have to imagine you know, that he doesn't look good in a pink sweatsuit. But we thought, we thought we'd see how Scott looks in a pink sweatsuit. There he is. Uh, I think he looks pretty good with dreads. And we'll just put that up next week for him when he preaches uh, on this. And uh, nice dreads there, Scott. Uh, so Scott talked a little bit about the, how the good news, the whole, the true gospel is, is about aligning us as people. It's about bringing us together as individuals, but also as a community, and, and aligning us with the love of God and the love of neighbor. That is what the gospel is about. And so here's a picture of the woman fixed. She's, she's aligned with the heart of Jesus. And um, today, we're going we're gonna, to, I'm going to show the, the other picture, the next slide, the, the integrate, or the uh, the disintegrated person and, and all these um, different parts of who we are. This is, this is kind of what Scott's writing about is how, how all these different parts, God can bring them together. And so each week we're talking about one of these. Today is, is the chest, the heart. We're talking about what is the heart and what are the, what are the implications for the gospel on the heart? And so first we need to know what do we mean by the heart? What does the heart mean? Obviously there's the physical heart. But there's also, there's also the, the spiritual heart. There's something that's talked about in scripture 900 times. I think it was pretty important. 900 times God mentions the heart 
in his word. Proverbs 4.23 says this, watch over your heart with all diligence. From it flows the springs of life. So there are, there are times where it talks about the physical heart, but it's more about the core of who we are. The core of who we are is our heart. And Scott writes this in his work, the, the, the heart is the center of one's being, one's, feel, one's feelings, passions, fears, values, dreams, and ability to love. A person lives from his or her heart. It's the place we make decisions. It's our will. It is the core of who we are. So this is a great place to start. What does the gospel say? What is the good news for our heart this morning? The good news. The first thing I, I want to say, the first piece of good news is that, that God doesn't care what you look like. Amen? Come on. I mean, that's, that's good news, right? You know, I don't know about you. Sometimes when I look in the mirror, I'm like, uh, no. You know, and it just, God, God doesn't care. It says God looks at the heart. He doesn't care about outward appearances. So that is a piece of good news right there. Um, uh, God also, he respects our, our heart. He respects the freedom of our heart. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. But first, before we get to the full good news, I want to get to the bad news. And that, that is that our hearts have a disease. Scriptures say that the, the core of who we are, the center of, of who we are, our heart, has a disease. Listen to Isaiah 1, 5 and 6. Your whole head is injured. Your whole heart afflicted. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there is no soundness. Only wounds, welts, open sores. Not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with olive oil. We are a people who are disintegrated, who are wounded from our souls to our heads, our whole being. Our heart is wounded. Jeremiah says this in 17.9, the heart is deceitful above all things, beyond cure. Who can understand this? The heart is deceitful above all things, beyond cure. There is no cure for the disease that our hearts have. There's no cure for it. Do you sense that in your heart? There is no cure. It's beyond cure. So what's the only option for a heart that is beyond cure? It's a heart transplant, right? That's the only option. And let's turn to Ezekiel. If you have your Bibles, I want you to pull out Ezekiel 11. We're going to read this as our main scripture here this morning. And uh, this is the good news for our heart that is diseased, that is wounded. And this is a time written, Ezekiel is a prophet in the Old Testament, written during Israel's lowest point. They had, they had uh, been to the promised land. They'd, they'd tasted the milk and honey. They were so stoked on life and, and all that was in it. And then they let their hearts go astray. And, and there was uh, idols began to creep in their lives. And they, uh, they started worshiping other things. And they, they lost their focus on God. And so what did God do? He took his hand of protection off, his, off Israel, off his people. And, and then soon they, they were overcome by, uh, by their enemies. And they were exiled to Babylon and scattered over, over nations. And so here's where we, we hear from Ezekiel, this low place that Israel's in. Therefore say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I will gather you from the nations I will bring you back from the countries where you've been scattered. I will give you back the land of Israel again. They will return to it and remove all its vile images and detestable idols. I will give them an undivided heart. I will put my spirit, a new spirit, in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Then they will follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. They will be my people and I will be their God. A heart transplant. What a profound image of the good news for us. That God wants to take out our stony heart and put in a heart of flesh. 
What an amazing image. It's, it's hard to grasp the miracle of a heart transplant, isn't it? It's just hard to understand. And, and even more, the, the news that you would hear that you have a new heart, literally, waiting for you if your physical heart stopped. I want everyone just to take your fingers like this. You probably know how to do this. I want you to feel your pulse, feel it beating. You've got to, got to find it in there a little bit, a couple times. Okay, got it? Everyone have a pulse? Okay, we're all alive. That's good. A hundred thousand times a day, your heart is beating. A hundred thousand times. That's amazing. It is an incredible muscle. When you study the heart, just there's a little that I've looked into it. It's just, it's a miracle that our bodies work and that this core organ is keeping us alive. What if your heart just stopped working? Take a look at this. started running out of breath. Uh, for me to climb the stairs at work, took two to three, four rest stops so I could stop and catch my breath. Walking from the parking lot to the office, took four or five stops so that I could catch my breath. So clearly something was wrong. <coughs> I was a healthy guy a year and a half ago. I was working out, I was running, uh, by all appearances, in good shape. And I passed out twice in one day, could have been driving. I could have, I was, in one case I was working out, I had 145 pounds over my neck. None, none of those two times I passed out happened then. The cardiologist here sent me down to a specialist at Cedar sinai did a heart biopsy, and said, well, we'll get back to you in a month, because that's how long it usually takes to culture the tissue. Well, he called me the next day. Turns out I have an extremely rare disease called giant cell myocarditis. So they said, you have to come in, we have to get your heart stabilized. It's a progressively degenerative disease, and we have to stabilize that degeneration of your heart. So I went in and started a 44-day stint at Cedar sinai and was, uh, came to realize that there was only one way out of this. Uh, I needed a transplant. I was put on the list where the waiting began. Those are probably the longest days of, in anyone's life is waiting for hope, waiting for something to come through that you know you need to save your life. <clears throat> and in some respects, it's the way Jesus is always there for people that feel they're out of hope. I don't know how people who don't know Jesus could go through something like that and not have a sense of comfort for what would happen if they die. I just knew it was not my time. And I also knew that if it was my time, that so be it. I can, I can become with Jesus. My only concern would have been for Susie and the people that I would have left behind. But I knew that, that I was being taken care of either way. But a deep part of me felt that now is not my time. And all of a sudden, all those days of waiting and wondering whether it was going to be an abyss I'd be constantly stating into, we're gone. And the response was simply shock. Just shock. I knew that this day was coming, that that day of hope had finally arrived. And from that point for the next uh, 24 hours was a flurry of activity. I had to lie on the table for what seemed like an eternity while they were prepping the other, the other heart and getting everything ready. And the mask came on feel myself drifting off I just kept repeating the power and the peace of Jesus and I woke up less than 12 hours later uh, I had me sit up a couple hours after that and that night I had what I laughing referred to as my first supper as opposed to the last supper uh, solid food and they had me up and walking within 24 hours and the whole thing was just one series of miracles after another in my case, it was the physical heart that was put into me. In the case of receiving the good news, it's receiving the heart of Jesus. Because that is, that is, to me, the difference that he has brought to the world. Is It's a personal thing. This is his heart for you, and his heart becomes our standard, and his love becomes the love that we can latch onto and realize it's a universal love at one point, but at the same point, it's a very deeply personal love.
Can we just praise God for a miracle for a minute? John's right here in the, uh, the fourth row. And uh, whew, he, above all of us, can, can understand this passage in a deeper sense. And uh, thanks for sharing your story with us. What a miracle. Praise God. Can you put yourself in, in John's shoes for just a minute? Just put yourself in there. The diagnosis of a failing heart, the emotion, the fear, the uncertainty of life. Did you hear what he said? He had a progressively degenerative disease. He came to the realization there's only one way out. What an incredible metaphor for all of us this morning. There's only one way out. That's, that's our diagnosis, spiritually speaking. We have a degenerative disease in our heart. There is only one way out. And maybe this morning you haven't come to terms with the diagnosis of your heart. But the scriptures tell us we, we have this disease. It's, it's not going away and we are going to die. And there's only one way out. And so how did John experience the good news of, of a heart transplant? He first had to admit, he had to, he had to agree with the doctors, you're right, there is something drastically wrong with me. And it wasn't hard for him to, to do that because walking upstairs was hard. But for us, spiritually speaking, I, I think we, we also, we, we got to admit, there is something in us, we all know it, deep inside of us, that is wrong that is not the way it's supposed to be. Our diagnosis is that our heart is diseased. There's only one way out. John also had to have a doctor because uh, he couldn't just go lay, in, lay on the operating room and open himself up and take his heart out and put a new one in. That, that doesn't work, right? You gotta have a doctor that, that does it for you. A doctor that you trust. And I can't imagine the trust you had going into that OR. The trust you had for another person to take your, your heart out of your body and put a new one in. What tremendous trust that would take. And, and that's really the, what God calls us to in this good news. He calls us to trust him. Listen to what he says in Ezekiel. The I will statements. I will give you back the promised land. I will give you an undivided heart. I will put a new spirit in you. I will remove your heart of stone. I will give you a heart of flesh. I will be your God. It's about trusting God. The, the gospel is only experienced through trust. Nothing we can do or earn or work our way to a new heart. And John also had to, to experience the good news. He needed a donor. He needed a donor of a heart. And someone else, you think about this for a minute, someone else had to die for John to live. That, that is such a hard reality, I'm sure, to accept when you're waiting for a transplant. Someone has to die for you to live. But that's, that's the truth. That's, what, that's the only way a transplant can happen, right? For an organ like this, is the heart. Something John didn't say in the video, but his chances of finding a donor were less than half of 1%, right? Less than half of 1%. And so it was just such a miracle that, that a heart even came up that was able to be put in John's body. And I, I know John would want me to say, he didn't, we didn't get it in the video either, but uh, just, just ha give a plug for organ donors. If, if you're not an, an organ donor, you can save someone's life. And John's a living testimony to that. So whatever, whatever you have to do to be an organ donor, I signed something that did, at the DMV and they put it on my license. So just, I wanted to give that little plug for John. I know he's really passionate about organ donation, obviously. Um, uh, so, be an organ donor. Um, but for a transplant, that's what we need. We need a donor. 
and I, I think you know where I'm going with this. Uh, the scriptures say that there is a heart for us. There's a heart waiting for all of us. We have been given a donor. God laid down the son of his life, the life of his son on the cross. And, and his heart was sufficient. It was sufficient for all of us to receive his spiritual heart in us. He is the donor. So maybe some of you this morning are, are just stuck in the waiting room. You, you don't believe this good news, that it can be this good, that God could really change your heart, give you a heart transplant. Maybe you haven't opened your life up to the great surgeon, God. And, and we, wanna, we wanna let you know, this, this is a great morning to do it. You could do it whoever, with whoever, with our prayer team up here, wherever you want. Um, but God may be calling you for, to, to step into the OR this week or today and, and say, God, I, I want your heart. I want to be aligned. I'm tired of living this life of fragments, of chaos. And so my encouragement to you would just be to, to open up your heart this morning and invite God to do surgery on your heart. For others of us, we, like, like me, we may have been saying, gosh, I've, I've had, I, I feel like I've, I've opened up my heart to God and, and yet I still battle with this stony heart. I still battle every day with the heart that, that I know is still in me. God said he's gonna remove it, right? I will remove your stony heart. Why, why does it feel like it's still there sometimes? And when Jesus came and he preached the good news, he said, the kingdom of heaven is near. It's, it's here, but it's not fully here yet. We, we like to say it's now and not yet, the kingdom of heaven. And, and the kingdom of heaven is within us when we open our lives to God, but it is now and not yet. And so we do still have to battle. We still have to, have to uh, enter into this journey with God. I love what, what Dallas Willard said about life with Jesus. He said this, it's not a passive life. And he reminds us of the story of the Israelites going into the promised land. In the beginning, the conquest of the promised land, the walls of Jericho just fell down. God said, welcome to the kingdom. But that never happened again. The Israelites had to take the remaining cities through hand-to-hand -hand warfare, though always still with divine assistance. Life comes with careful, persistent, intelligent human action over a long period of time. God uses us and our intelligent, human, persistent, careful action. And so we need to keep submitting to the heart of God, to the heart of Christ in us, because it is now and not yet. And I think what Ezekiel, this passage does for me as I was studying it is, it's kind of like taking an EKG. You know what an EKG is? Let's put that image up on the screen. An EKG measures your heart and it, it tests for heart disease. And John, you've had a few of those. EKGs, I'm sure. If you've ever been hooked up to one, you, each one of those little mountains and valleys means something that I don't pretend to know what it means. But it they, they means that you're, you have a healthy heart. And as they watch the progression, it, it, it's a measurement. And so I think as we come back together on Sundays to remember the good news, we also come back to get a heart check. Kind of like a gut check, but for your heart. A heart check. And so we want you to give you a, a heart check this morning. I want to give you, give you one, and Ezekiel gives us the, the formula, a, a quick formula for this heart check to know, are we submitting? Are we continuing down this path of, of living in the life and the heart of Jesus? And this is how we know. This, there's just three simple things in this passage. The first one is God gives us an undivided heart, an undivided heart heart. Charles Spurgeon says this about an undivided heart. Our minds are so apt to be divided between a variety of objects like trickling streamlets which waste their force in a hundred runnels. Our great desire should be to have all our life floods poured into one channel 
and have that channel toward the Lord alone. An undivided heart. That was the heart of Jesus as we look at the life of Christ. His heart was ever focused on the love of God and the love of neighbor. And we are so divided, aren't we? Do you you feel divided in your life? I mean, just going in a hundred different directions at any minute. We are, we're created to love and to pursue things passionately. And when we're not aligned with the love of God and love of neighbor, we put other things in the position of ultimate importance. I love what Tim Keller writes. He writes this, the heart is an idle factory. An idle factory. We take good things and we make them, we turn them into ultimate things. And Ezekiel tells us that an undivided heart is committed to throwing down smashing the idols that arise in our life. I I love what Scott wrote in his work. He wrote, the human heart will substitute the love of God for the love of hobbies, sex, friends, riches, possessions, security, power, influence, comfort, and pleasure, to name a few. Take good things and put them in in, in the ultimate, the place of ultimate importance. And what does God say? When we have an undivided heart, we will cast down these images, these detestable idols. The EKG for you this morning may just be to to listen to your heart. What is in the place of ultimate importance? What idols do I need to keep smashing, keep throwing down so I can live in the heart of Jesus? Second, he re, uh, Ezekiel reminds us, we've been given a heart of flesh. A heart of flesh. When we hear that word flesh in the New Testament, most of the times it means sin and, and brokenness and um, just evil. But in this sense, the heart of flesh is, is opposed to the heart of stone. It's a heart that's, that's tender, that's responsive, that's beating, that is, is, uh, is just responsive to God, a heart that's fully aligned and sensitive with the heart of the Father. This is a heart that does not just go through the motions of religion. And we see this so clearly in the life of Jesus as he walks around. He, he has this compassion on people. We see it over and over. Jesus looks out over the people or he comes in contact with someone and he has compassion on them. Compassion. And that word compassion, it's from the center of our being. It's this word, splagazomai, that means just the core of our, of our being and it's where we feel deeply. Jesus had compassion. He had the heart of his father. That's what he was continually submitting to. He had this heart of flesh that was responsive to the words and the promptings of the father. One of my biggest fears, I think, as a, as a pastor is that we would just become a church that is going through the motions. That we'd become a people that just come on Sunday morning and get a feel-good message and come back the next week and the next week and get into this routine of religion. And, and I just want to remind us, that is not why we come together. We are not here for religion, people. We are here after the heart of God because his heart is real, it's alive, it's in us. He wants us to experience it. He wants us to submit to his heart, to respond to his heart. So where in in your life have you become unresponsive? Where is the heart of stone winning in your life as you listen to your heart this morning? God, take away our hearts of stone. Finally, we see God gives us a heart of devotion to him. Notice the end of this passage. He says, they will be my people and I will be their God. They will be my people and I will be their God. This is a a huge phrase in the Bible throughout all of scripture. And Andrew, our ministry intern, as we were talking, reminded me of of just that this is pointing back to the covenant that God made with Abraham and Moses and Israel. 
This is covenant language. You will be my people and I will be your God. That's what God said to his people. The covenant that he is in it with us. And this covenant really reminds us, it, it's a picture uh, of, of how deep his love and his commitment to us is. And marriage is an image of this covenant. When we enter into the covenant of marriage, we, uh, uh, is, this is modeled after the covenant that God has made with his people. And, and uh, in a couple of weeks, I get to celebrate my 14th anniversary. Can't believe it's been 14 years. Feels like just a couple. Uh, and I feel so, so blessed to have married the right person um, and, and to ask Aaron to be my wife. But uh, as I said this 14 years ago, I said, I, Jono, take you, Aaron, to be my wife. I said, I am going to belong to you and you're going to belong to me. I am fully devoted. My heart my heart's devotion, my affections are going to be solely for you. That is what it means to be in a covenant, that, that this heart of devotion, that our hearts are solely after God. He wants our affections. He doesn't want us to just go through the motions he wants our affections. A heart of devotion. Listen to what, what Calvin said and then we'll close up. The only haven of safety is to have no other will, no other wisdom than to follow the Lord wherever he leads. Let this then be the first step to abandon ourselves and devote the whole energy of our minds and hearts to the service of God. Where has your heart grown cold? To the Lord. We're, we're in this battle, you guys. It's now and not yet. We are in this battle together and, and God wants us to realize it. As we've, if we've opened up our life to him and, and experienced the newness of his heart and his spirit in us, we still need to battle to be undivided to have a single focus in our life. We need to have a heart of flesh that's responsive, that's beating, that's ready for action. We need to have a heart of devotion. We need to give our affections to him. We're gonna have uh, a little worship time uh, right now and we're gonna come to the table where we celebrate the new covenant that is sealed in the blood of Jesus. This is what he came to, to remind us of, that he's made a covenant with us. And this new covenant, when Jesus died on the cross, he, he uh, gave us a new covenant. He, he made a new commitment to us that his heart of flesh, the, the incarnational heart of Jesus, spiritually will be implanted in us. And that we can be in relationship with him and have a heart that's fully devoted to following him and living out the heart of Jesus. So we're gonna give you some time. We're gonna do communion a little differently today. If, um, you, you, you know, it's totally voluntary always. You know, you never, you never have to take communion. So uh, you know that. And, and we don't have a special handshake or anything like that here. You just, you know, if, if you're not...